So we're here today, I have John Gates, who's VP of product for CropEx, which is an innovative Israeli ag tech company that has extensive operations in the US and globally. I also have Ankit Chandra from the Dorothy Water for Food Global Institute with me. So John, you've had a number of different roles related to agriculture, innovation, and entrepreneurship. Can you tell us a little bit about your personal journey as an entrepreneur working in irrigation? Yeah, I'd be glad to, Nick. So I have had a little bit of a, a, a windy path. As you know, we overlapped in the Water for Food Institute for a couple of years in the University of Nebraska. I have worked both in the academic sector and in small and big companies alike. Somebody asked me a little while back when I got interested in water and agriculture, and I tried to think of a of an origin and I, I kept going back and back into my youth and it just goes all the way back. The earliest story I could think of, I think I was a toddler or so, but my, um, my, my grandmother who lived in a small town was a volunteer for a water monitoring nonprofit. And she would take me water quality sampling with like the little test kits that you see. And I feel like I've been hooked at a very early age and, and never could get any more interested in anything else besides water and agriculture. So I went on and sort of kept that strand in, in my entire career. I was a university professor for several years, got very interested in what was happening in ag tech in the private sector and just the scale of innovation and the speed of progress. So I had to give that a try as well. And I at that time I, I joined a small technology company that quickly grew to a big technology company. I never did lose the the startup, the scrappy startup bug after that time, so ended up getting back into the startup space more recently. Thank you. That's great. Well, thanks for the answer, John. I mean, that's a very interesting story, and I, I love the pathway you followed. One related question there, what motivates you to work in the field you are in right now? Yeah, well, I have to say that, you know, it's an easy choice for me because it's fundamentally fun work for me. You know, the ability to get to work with, with farmers directly, to work with data and high-tech applications of data and connected devices, a good excuse to get outside and work in the outdoors once in a while, and, you know, just this very fast-paced industry that's you know, just innovating in so many directions at the same time. It's an exciting time to be in it. I will also say, you know, maybe a two-part answer. I am drawn to working on rural issues. I grew up in a very small town in Arkansas. And, you know, wonderful place, but, you know, like, like a lot of small towns, some economic challenges, some economic transformations that are coming at them. And it's very motivating to me to have the prospect of being able to help the farm sector in some way. Ag tech is a great playground to play in between the, the people and the technology and the problem. So that answer definitely resonates with me. Yeah. So what are the current trends or innovations that you see in irrigated agriculture that you're most excited about? Yeah, well, maybe I'm... Just maybe the first part of the answer, I might back up a step to agriculture in general and agriculture technology. And, um, you know, there, it, there's a bunch of things. There's huge transformation happening essentially all, all over the industry. You know, the technologies are moving fast. The adoption is happening and probably accelerating, I would say. There's a lot of drivers, as you know, for change and innovation in, in the ag sector right now. You know, just from that, that entrepreneurship standpoint, you know, there, there is a lot of excitement around agricultural investing, ag tech investing, and so the capital's there for, for new entrepreneurs. It's a wonderful time to, to be in the space and to be, um, to, to be making an impact. On irrigation specifically, just to drill down on that a little bit, there's also a lot of things that... In, that I am enthused about right now. But I would say if I had to pick one, you know, it's, it's just the fact that data-driven tools are catching on. There are still a lot of traditional practices that haven't changed in a couple generations on water management uh, out there and water management decision-making. Of course, the hardware evolution has, has been happening, but the, 
the management of that hardware and the decision making around that hardware, you know, I really see a trend towards the ability of tools to use data to to make decisions in a more adaptive way in season, changing environment, changing conditions, and that's, you know, ultimately I think that's that's going to have a big impact on on the bottom line on the farm, make farmers more confident and, and resilient to change. Um, so I think that's a good thing. Well, that's very interesting. I think you pointed out a couple of challenges there, like one is the irrigation decision making is a problem, and then you mentioned about the traditional uh, irrigation practice. What is the biggest challenge you see for irrigation innovation that we haven't been able to crack yet? One thing that I would, I would love to see change, and it, and it will change, and it is changing, this is putting my um, kind of my, my farm data hat on for a minute. Having looked at an awful lot of yield data and maps of yield, water data, you know, water really is one of the biggest drivers of agronomic outcomes on the field. And if you look at your crop productivity and profitability across the field and you see some patterns, more often than not, there's a water story behind it. I think that word has not gotten out to all of agriculture. Of course, irrigation specialists know this and they preach it. And I think it's, it's starting to, we're starting to spread the word better. And so that's one thing I'd like to see us uh, speed up a little bit. And I, it's going to happen. I know it will happen. Oh, sure. Yeah, that's a great answer, I would say. John, let me follow up on that a little bit. You've mentioned irrigation specialists and others in the field starting to spread the word on the importance of water. What do you think really needs to happen to move the needle on how people view water and its value in agriculture? You know, for me, the short answer is proof points. And this being a, uh, a project you're working on partly on entrepreneurship, this is one of the hardest things for a new organization to get on top of. As a startup, you have to figure out how to move fast, scale quickly, and at least if you're talking about an annual row crop situation, one yield season per year is, uh, is awfully tough to get around. Right. You want to get your message out that you're providing positive return on investment for the farmer. Maybe there's other outcomes that you want to spread the word on, your ability to promote regenerative, your ability to save natural resources, whatever it is that your value prop is. But you got to get out there and have other people besides you talk about it you got to have those proof points. So I think funda a, a fundamental challenge for, for small companies working in the space is how to get that scale and, and how to speed up that development process. Thank you. Great answer, John. So you have had experiences of working in different countries uh, related to water, ag, and irrigation. So yeah. Yeah, I've been lucky. <laughs> Great. So when you look at the different countries, what differences do you see in how customers think about irrigation and innovation adoption? Well, I mean, one thing to point out is, um, and we were talking a little bit before the mics started rolling, but innovation's everywhere. Oh my goodness. Right. Um, there are amazing technologies and organizations coming out of every continent, many countries. So there's there's reason for optimism basically everywhere I look. When you turn your attention over to the market side a little bit more and like what are the things you have to get right for different marketplaces, everywhere you look is tremendously different. There is just, and it's not just international, you know, we, um, we can talk about just moving from state to state or watershed to watershed even here in the right. United States. Very different sets of challenges for water managers out there, depending on where you are. Uh, sometimes it's the, uh, the cost of electricity, sometimes it's finding the water allocations, sometimes it's optimizing and reducing uh, leaching or what have you. So, tremendously different. You know, a few other countries that I've been working in a little bit more intensively recently have been in the Southern Hemisphere. Uh, Australia and New Zealand are, are a couple of examples there. And, you know, New Zealand's a, a very interesting case because they have a uh, very large dairy industry and as, as a percentage of their total GDP, it's a, re it's a really big deal. 
and you know they have a, a very different set of irrigation needs for grazing in that dairy space than you do for for example a Nebraska row, tro- row crop situation so you know I, I work at a company that develops technology and you know we we really try to tune the technology to solve the concrete tangible problems in whatever market we're working in and so you know part part of our job is to go and understand how those problems differ and how to adapt the technology accordingly right thank you John so John many of us that work in water collect fun factoids that we like to share with people that don't work in water that yes. are su- surprising about water and agriculture yeah, and, and I like its those role too. so what can you share some of the things that you've learned that are that would be surprising to somebody that that isn't really immersed in this uh, world of agriculture and water oh you know water and soils it's full of surprises i will share maybe one fun fun fact just about the uh the scale i'm thinking back to a project that got me interested in ag tech in the private sector in the first place and it was at the University of Nebraska, working with Water for Food Group, and also Coca-Cola was involved as a funder on the project, a couple other state agencies involved. And, you know, we worked with a few farmers to get precision technology adopted, and, uh, you know, towards the year one, we wanted to take a step back and look at our impact. And so, we, you know, we did some of those back-of-the-napkin calculations based on all the data that we had. And we, we showed that to our funding partners, and it, it, was a, it was a big aha moment. You know, just the fact that irrigated agriculture has so many acres, if you're able to save just an inch or two across many fields, that just adds up so fast. So I guess, you know, the fact that, that sticks in my mind, this is a, a calculation that, that we have at uh, CropEx, my, my current organization. You look across the total footprint of ours of the acres that we help manage water on on a year-to-year basis, and you calculate up what's the impact, how much water are we able to uh, save, and the answer that we got for last year, just just as a benchmark, was about the same size of water savings as the total domestic water consumption of a medium-sized U.S. city. So think Omaha, Nebraska. Uh, Austin, Texas, Washington, D.C., somewhere in that neighborhood. And, uh, you know, to me, I I just come back to numbers like that time and time again. You know, anytime I have any doubt about, uh, hey, are we making an impact? It's just really reinvigorating to just to do those sums and kind of do a gut check of, of where you are and what you can accomplish. That's a great example of real impact. Thank you for sharing that, John. And that's all we have. Special thanks to John Gates for joining us and sharing his perspective on water, agriculture, and innovation. 